So I've been preparing to teach you guys an opening of mine. It's a slightly unusual opening. And the next step in uh, learning that opening is to understand a little bit more of the differences between one D4 and one E4. And so we want to think logically about the very starting position of chess. and e4 versus d4 and compare them logically like what we did when we talked about b3 or when we talked about the french in the how to learn an opening segment so what are the differences between e4 and d4 what 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 what's fundamentally different about this if not for the king and queen e4 and d4 would be like symmetrical moves they'd be exactly the same right and each of the moves fulfills some of the same purposes, but there are some crucial differences between the two moves. Um, let's start off with something which may be painfully beneath some of you because you're already so good, but it can be very useful to make sure you've got the fundamentals down. Let's start off by just trying to list what E4 does for you or what, e, or what D4 does for you. I'm going to give you like 10 or 20 seconds to think about it, and then I'm going to start giving my answers. So if you want to think about it more, pause the video somehow and then catch up, okay? All right, so we've got a cool suggestion that e4 is bringing white a step closer to castling because this bishop needs to move in order to castle. I'm going to fill in some gaps for what for what this player is assuming, right? This bishop needs to move for castling. So if you want to castle the fastest possible in this game, you need to move either your e pawn or g pawn. So e4 prepares for quick castling and the move d4 on the other hand um allows the c4 break as well for more play with your queen more open play with your queen, bringing her power into the game a little bit sooner. Uh, e4 also opens the bishop and moves the pawn to the center. Right. And the value of putting the pawn on e4 as far as like moving it to the center, today we are playing some hypermodern defenses as black, so does having the pawn in, in the center, is that a good thing or a bad thing, right? You're saying it like it's a good thing. What would be the good part of having this pawn in the center? The good thing in this case would be controlling the square d5. That's the advantage of it. Um, more than like having a pawn on e4, it's like that your pawn on e4 is helping you control the square d5. Okay. Um, someone's also saying already that one of the big differences between e4 and d4 is that generally you may have to protect the e4 pawn, which is undefended. And when you play d4, your pawn is already defended. So in d4 openings, the pawn that you've placed in the center to stake out control over a square in the center, as well as to allow the development of your pieces, this pawn is not vulnerable in d4 as well as much as it is in e4, where it's undefended. And that is definitely one of the things I was going for. So that's very that's that's definitely one of the differences between e4 and d4, which we'll talk about more. Um. All right, so I'm going to say another advantage to e4 and d4, which hasn't been mentioned yet at this point, and that is that both moves are played to secure a square for your knights, um, and really to secure, secure two squares for your knights, okay? So one of the important things in the opening is that you want to be able to put your knight on a square where it controls the center for you, but you also don't want your knight to get attacked, okay? Every square that you consider for putting a piece on has a couple things that tell you whether or not it's a good square. Okay, one is how much does your piece do on that square? The second is how secure is your piece on that square? In other words, can your opponent chase your piece off of the square that you think is so good? Those are the two most important things, but there's a third factor 
which can also be relevant, which is kind of like flexibility. So you can think, you can think in terms of like, is my knight doing something good right now? Yes. Is my knight safe here? Maybe. We'll get to that in a second. And then does my knight have flexibility? So not only am I controlling these two squares now, but do I have the option to change what my knight's doing if something else comes up? That's how you evaluate the square of pieces on. Now today, we were playing an opening called the Eliakian's Defense. Let's evaluate the knight on f6. Is it doing something important? Yes. Is it secure on f6? No. Um, someone's already mentioned that the e4 pawn is undefended, which is an important aspect of e4 openings. We talked about it the other day, saying that against e4, two of the best defenses for black are both based on playing e6 or c6, and then d5 to attack the pawn that's undefended and challenge it. Whereas against d4, you do not see d6 or f6 played in order to just challenge the pawn right away with e5. It's not going to apply the same pressure to your d4 pawn because your d4 pawn is defended. Okay, so, so knight f6 in theory, a very useful square, attacking e4, controlling d5, which white's move e4 was played to control d5, and attacking this, this weak pawn on e4. So the knight is very useful here. However, the reason why some people don't like the Eliakian's defense is not because white can defend the e pawn with d3 or knight c3. It's because of e5. And the thing that the thing that you realize quickly here is that the knight on f6 is an example of a piece that's not on a secure square. In other words, it can be chased away at any point. If you compare this, there's another hypermodern opening which starts with d6 instead of knight f6, the Peart's defense. The whole idea of d6 is to secure the f square for the knight. Does that make sense? So it's saying like knight f6 is a useful square like we see in the Adekins, but I want to secure f6 before I put the knight here. So if d4, then I play knight f6 and I can attack e4 because I have this tactic. So e5 has been tactically prevented and this d6 pawn is securing the f6 square by preventing e5. Okay, now by and large in the starting position, the best squares for your knights are these four squares. But one of the things about playing black is that white usually starts out by putting pawns in the center. And then if you put your knights on f6 or c6, white can chase them away. Um, Aljechen, I think, but I, you should ask somebody else to, to tell you how to say it, not me. I, I don't know for sure. Okay, so a big part of the early game is the question of whether or not these knights are secure. They can get attacked by pawns coming straight up the board. Uh, they can also get attacked by side pawns, as we've discussed in the, the knight orf. So in the knight orf, you've got these two knights, which are on really good squares, and they're fighting over this pair of squares, e4 and d5, the key squares. Um, black would love to free their game by playing d5 or by taking the pawn on e4 and white's trying to control those two squares to keep their space advantage in the center. Um, these two knights are doing something very, very important. So the two players will often go to great lengths to stop them. Okay. So a6, what's the point of a6? It's to show that this knight is not secure on c3. What about h3? Same thing. So if you guys have seen these kind of pawn moves in the Sicilian defense before, you'll know what this fight is all about. The fight is about the security of the squares f6 and c3 because those are such useful squares for the knights. They're doing the best thing a knight can do in this position. And so both players want to disrupt those knights and show that they're not secure on those squares. And that is also why you sometimes see people play moves like this or this. They are securing the square for their knight. Okay? That is the whole point of the h6 or a3 type of move is securing the square. So now your knight is on a square that's super useful, right? 
and you've secured it with d6 and h6, right? And the reason that you played d6 on move two in this variation of the Sicilian is specifically because you want to play knight f6 with your knight secured by this pawn. And once you see someone playing h3, now you'll see people sometimes securing the knight from the other side. Notice h6 is generally an undesirable move, right? Like, it's not improving black's position at all. It's making a pawn move on the side of the board where black tends to be a little bit weaker. And it doesn't help develop his pieces at all. And in combination with the pawn on d6, you can quickly find yourself with weak light squares if you do this. So you're really depending on this one knight that you've secured on a dark square to control all these light squares that white could approach through. So really emphasizing um, securing and maintaining the knight on that square. So if you look at the starting position, you could say that one of the points of playing e4 is so that when I play knight f3, my knight is on a both useful and secured square because black can't play e4. The whole concept behind the Rui Lopez where, fight, where white fights over these two squares is based on his knight being on a secure square. Right? So that can be seen as one of the points of e4. You can also see e4 as securing c3 for this knight by preventing the d5 advance from black, right? That's another way you could see that. So um, being able to play knight c3 and it's hard for your opponent to play d5, d4 because you're trying to stop them already at the d5 square, okay? So e4 partially secures both your knight f3 and your knight c3 squares. It blocks the e pawn and it helps control the opponent's d pawn. It doesn't stop someone from attacking your knight with their G pawns or their B pawns, but generally it's less desirable in the opening to fling your knight pawns forward because it leaves big weaknesses behind. Um, that said, E4 and D4 both have this in common. D4 also secures knight C3 by blocking this D pawn and secures knight F3 partly by controlling your opponent's attempts to play E5. So quick detour, what about the moves c4 and f4? Well, very quickly, we can say that the move f4 is really emphasizing securing the knight on f3. It's preventing both e5 and g5, and it's, secure, it's helping fight for e5 along with your knight on f3. Whereas the move c4 is strongly based around preventing b5, d5, d4, and having your knight on c3 and controlling d5 with a secure knight on c3 plus a pawn on c4. Okay, so those move e moves each have that element of really securing one of your knights very, very well, but they're not affecting the other knight. Okay, um, e4 and d4, on the other hand, each secure both knights a little bit, these two squares. All right, so that's what e4 does, that's what d4 does. Now, what's the difference between e4 and d4? The difference is simply how they relate to the positions of the king and the queen. Okay, The first difference is that e4 is undefended and d4 is defended. right? But the second difference has to do with potential follow-ups. If e4 is defended, if d4 is defended, sorry, it is harder to follow up with e4 because e4 is actually undefended. So in a large number of defenses to d4, black will successfully control the e4 square and keep white from following up with e4. Whereas in the vast majority of e4 openings, black is unable to stop white from following up with d4. You follow? Um, now let's see some examples of how the undefended e pawn versus the defended d-pawn affect certain kinds of openings if you just flip the board, okay? So here's the Italian game. Okay, the Italian game allows you to bring your bishop out here and then play d3, c3, and maybe d4 at some point. Okay. Um, Let's compare that with, with d4, d4, d5, knight c3, 
Knight f6, bishop f4. The Jobava. Um, in the Jobava, people criticize this opening um, because of the position of the knight on c3. Right? This opening was pretty much not played until one or two years ago. Two years ago, pretty much. Um, it was not played by many players at all. And uh, the Georgian Grandmaster Bahadur Jobava, who I'm calling this opening after, um, uh, he plays this with the knight on c3. Now, why was this opening ignored for so long? Essentially because this knight seems to fight for this pair of squares. Right? Um, but most people think that white doesn't have very strong prospects of winning control over these two squares here with the knight on c3. Why does white have trouble winning control over these two squares? Well, the c, the c pawn is blocked by the knight, so we don't have c4 to win control over d5. d5 is also naturally defended by the queen, so there's really minimal pressure against d5. If you think of the Italian game for a moment, if we just flip back again, in the Italian game, even though white doesn't put tremendous pressure on, on e5, they do put some pressure on e5, right? It's not defended in advance by the queen, and black will seldom play f6. So there's often some pressure on e5 in the Italian game. Not, not like the most all-out pressure, like in some variations of the Rui Lopez or the King's Gambit, but definitely some pressure on e5. Whereas in the Jobava, that pressure is nearly non-existent. The second thing, as Iamism is sighing about correctly, is that if 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 white wants if white can't get control of d5, are they going to play f3 to try and get control of e4 at least? Because they got to do something to make use of this knight, no? So, ugh, we gonna play f3? I think he says, yeah, you might want to play f3 here and e4. Um, now, even if you play f3, that might not give you enough control of e4 to play e4. So, for example, bishop f5, f3, e6. Can white play e4 here? Not without losing a pawn, right? Um, on the other hand, if you flip over back and forth to the Italian, you can see right away in the Italian that after whatever, um, sorry, I'll play bishop c5 maybe, the, the same move, right? trying to control d4. White can play c3 and black can't prevent them from following up with d4. Right? And you can just calculate just the presence of the queen completely flips this. It's only move 4 of the opening, but in one you can force through e4 and in the other you can't. Okay? Um Now, Joe Baba started playing his opening partly because he found some ways to kind of like flip things on their heads. Like for example, he found that there were some positions where he could profitably suddenly play knight b5, knight a6, c4, and then just drop his knight back to c3 at some point when black plays c6, otherwise leave it on b5 pressuring c7. That's one example of something that he figured out that kind of changes things around. You know, And if your opponent spends time on moves like a6, then you might have a chance to do something else because they've wasted a tempo on a bad move. But we're not going to get too far into the Jobava today, just showing you that versus the Italian. And you can see that the Italian is one of the most popular openings in chess throughout history, played by lots of people. And um, the Jobava has been played by one a very original or eccentric uh, grandmaster only in the you know 2000 teens after 130 years of, of or maybe 140 years of serious chess development. Um, so also this move F3 to try and control E4 has some serious downsides to your king position. Um, whereas if you compare that back over here, the move C3 doesn't hurt white's king position at all since white will always have a secure king easily castling kingside in this opening, right? All right, now let's compare the gambit and the not gambit, okay? Whoops. We're going to get lost in this maze of variations in a second. King's gambit, 
versus Queen's Gambit. One of these has a tremendous reputation, the other doesn't. Okay. Um, what are the differences between the King's Gambit and the Queen's Gambit? Why should one be the most be like you know the the most played opening in the entire history of chess? and the other have a massive cloud over it and frequent articles written about refutations of it. One important difference, as Iamism is saying, is that the Queen's Gambit is not even a gambit. Right? That's a major that's a major difference between the two openings. The Queen's Gambit's not even a gambit. And there's um there's a surprising reason that the Queen's Gambit is not a gambit compared to the King's Gambit is a gambit. <laughs> so one of our viewers has said that the King's Gambit is like running around without your pants and another viewer says the Queen's Gambit puts you to sleep. So that's two very, very different things because if you ran around outside without your pants, people wouldn't be falling asleep. Not at all. Um, all right, so there's two major differences. Um, the one that's perhaps most obvious is over on the king's side, um, which is that the move f4 actually like opens your king up on this diagonal. So for example, after e takes f4, you immediately are facing a threat of queen h4. So you've like gravely endangered your own king's security when you play the move f4. On the other hand, when you play the move c4, instead of opening your king, you'll be opening your queen. So when we switch over here, now we've opened our queen instead of our king, which means we've given ourselves um, tactical possibilities like check. Instead of giving the opponent tactical possibilities like queen h4 check against our king. Okay. So that's the first big difference. Um, whether you're opening your queen or your king most of you probably prefer opening up your queen's possibilities to your king's possibilities. And even I, a devoted King's Gambit player, am on that side of the question. You should not be you should not be seeing opening your king as an advantage. You should be seeing opening your queen as an advantage. So there's that. The second important thing has to do with these two squares. It may not seem like the crux of it, but this is actually a very important tactical detail in terms of whether the King's Gambit or the Queen's Gambit is better okay so let me illustrate it with two simple variations takes on c4 e3 b5 defending the pawn right from the bishop and then b3 and in this position we see that b5 is an undefended square naturally speaking and that is an issue for black's ability to fight tactically around c4 Okay, now a relevant variation in the King's Gambit is that after the move, you can't even play d3 here, right? But even if instead of playing d3, we play knight f3, which is already fighting for g5, fighting to cut off this pawn from reinforcements, even against knight f3, black can play g5 because the queen happens to be on that square instead of the king. So the difference between the defense of b5 and g5 has a huge impact on whether or not these two openings are gambits, okay? Because the black queen naturally defending the g5 square means that black can capture the king's gambit and very easily follow up with g5 in a lot of lines and secure the pawn on f4. Whereas in the queen's gambit, the fact that black does not have a b5 defended um, helps white in breaking down any attempts by black to set up a defensive structure here. All right. So, yeah, so major advantage for white in the queen's gambit is that black can't even think of holding onto this pawn and that it improves their queen's possibilities. And there's a lot of lines in the queen's gambit, you know, where somehow the fact that you can move your queen has an important impact on the early game. Okay, and there's also similarly a lot of examples in the king's gambit where having your king involved in the action early is a distinct disadvantage for white. 
okay? So that certainly goes a long way towards explaining why the Queen's Gambit is better than the King's Gambit, I think. Um, let's see, what other... There was something else I wanted to cover. Oh, yes. I wanted to cover the impossibility of playing the London system when you play e4. I think this is also a revealing example. So against so with d4, there is an opening which doesn't involve c4 that just looks like this. It's not the Jobava and it's not the Queen's Gambit. It is the London system. Much beloved and much hated. Sometimes an important opening, sometimes not. At the simplest level, this opening clamps down on e5 without making any attempts to take over c4 or e4 for white. So it completely accepts a locked game, in other words. It does not fight to take a big opening advantage for white. or you know, But it does say... It does say that black is not going to um, break white's hold on d4 and e5. And it's often followed with the moves e3 and c3, creating an extreme strong point in the center. All right. So, so this um, allows us to really emphasize this and this and lets black really emphasize this and that. Remember how I said in some openings, in a lot of openings, there's a very crucial fight over one pair of central squares? In the London system, there is not. Instead, in the London system, white has dominion over these two squares and black has dominion over these two squares, and they each accept that. White certainly more than black, since that's the scenario they want. Black players will sometimes go crazy against London and try and fight what white is enforcing on them. But in theory, white's picked a pair of squares to dominate and given black a pair of squares to dominate. And white's able to do this because, naturally speaking, this is white's stronger square with the queen here, and this is white's weaker square. So white's completely abandoned e4 and completely strengthened d4 and e5. And by doing that, they basically ensure a maneuvering game and a pretty equal position out of the opening. Okay, now why can't you play this opening as white with e4? The reason is the point of that opening would be to completely dominate e4 and d4 and not fight for e5 and d4. Okay, But white is naturally strong on d4 and naturally weak on e4. So it's very hard for white to affect this. So black plays e5. And you can see white could already play d4 if they wanted to. But no, they play knight c3, trying to play the London system, right? And now... You know, black could play knight c6, and they could switch it up like this, and this, and this, and you could basically get a London system. And neither player is using their queen to try and get control of d4 or d5 quickly, and they just say, like, yeah, let's try and play, like, a London system on the other side of the board. I think it would be fun. So it can be done if both players are colluding to create this. Okay? But the thing is, black can also prevent it. On this move, black can play knight f6, fighting for control of d5. Since they naturally have the queen there, it turns out that white can't actually get control over e4 and d5 fast enough to guarantee a London system. The key variation is that on bishop c4, trying to control d5, black has the move knight takes e4. And this tactic obviously, hanging a piece, this tactic obviously leans very, very, very heavily on the queen's natural protection of the d5 square, right? Tactic is only possible because of this quick d5 from black, uh, regaining their peace and getting a fine game and preventing white from locking down e4 and d5 and getting a London system for sure, right? So, um, you know, instead you could play a move like f3 securing e4 this would be like c3 in the London system, preparing bishop c4 and then d3. But the problem is, already this has given black enough time to play d5. Right? And you're never going to lock down d5 if they've already played it. 
All right, so that wraps up what I wanted to show and tell you guys about the difference between d4 and e4, right? It's the natural control that the queen provides into the center that really changes these two moves. And if anyone has a question about that, ask that quickly. Otherwise, we're going to move on to other things. All right, we shall move on. There's a question from someone saying that they play black against, that they play the French as black and they love it. And then when they're white, they don't know how to get a position as fun as the French. Uh, a very good response here is that you can just play A3 and then play black, try and play the French. Another answer is you can play either E3 or B3 on move one. And those moves can both tend towards French type positions. So that is totally fine way to get there. Oh, you want to see what's the difference between like the Sicilian or the Dutch between E4 and D4? Yeah. So, um, so a major difference is that E4, C5, um, with, with the Sicilian, black is trying to restrain D4, but actually they can't restrain D4. White is always able to play an open Sicilian if they want to by simply playing knight f3 here. That's the really big difference. And they just force through d4, and you get this pawn trade between the c-pawn and the d-pawn, but you get white gaining temporary supremacy in the center in some kind of situation like this. Black has long-term potential in the center with his pawn majority, but white's always able to force this position if they want, which initially gives them... Uh, a lead in um, central influence and, and, and maneuvering space for their pieces. If instead we look at d4, f5. In this position, black can actually stop white from playing e4, um, except as a gambit. Obviously, you can play e4 as a gambit. Um, no one can stop you from playing it if you're willing to just lose a pawn, right? Um, and white can play like this and play it like uh, the Black Redeemer that we were looking at today. And so you can go for this kind of structure for white. Um, in the Black Redeemer, this pawn would be on f7. So there's pluses and minuses to having the d-pawn instead. Anyway, this is something you could do as white. But let's. But what I'm saying is outside of a gambit, you can't force through the move uh, e4. Knight f6 controls it. You can play bishop g5, trying to like trade it and play e4. But... I mean, first of all, trading on f6 could be seen as a concession. Second of all, the natural defense of the queen of the d5 square allows black to now play d5 if they want and really clamp down on e4. So basically, f5 does kind of stop e4, whereas c5 doesn't really stop d4, right? And again, it's this difference between with the queen here, you're not as well poised to play e4. So you've probably almost never seen people play like an open Sicilian on the wrong side of the board out of a Dutch, right? This just doesn't really happen because black just puts a knight on f6 and you don't see white achieving e4 other than in some gambit lines. Okay, so from that perspective, at first it sounds like the Dutch should be better than the Sicilian, right? Like it actually stops the move your opponent wants to make. But the Sicilian seems to have a better reputation than the Dutch. And that's a little bit of a mind bender or puzzle, huh? Um, which I'm trying to solve for you right now, trying to understand it myself a little bit here. It's going to have to do with like the closed variations. So basically, basically it has to do with the fact that people think you don't need to play e4 against the Dutch and you can get a perfectly good position by playing c4 and knight c3 and maybe g3, bishop g2, etc. Um, and people like those positions for white with this space here and a plan of expanding on the queen side or eventually playing e4 depending. <clears throat> 
Whereas against the Sicilian, people are not as excited about playing these positions with the kingside space. Um, these positions also come up through one c4 e5 and one f4 d5. And generally speaking, it seems that most people, and I'm not, I'm not convinced on this. I would say maybe for me, the jury is still out. I don't know this well enough to say. Um, but most people seem to think that, that this queenside space is better than the kingside space. So people prefer to be on the c4, d4 side of this rather than on the e4, f4 side of it. Um, now, I mean, the British players are an exception. The British players play the Grand Prix attack and seem to think it's fine. Um, but in top level chess, most chess players seem to like playing d4 and c4 against the Dutch and seem to think that this space on the king side is not as good. And I think it has to do with the general fear of advancing pawns on the side of your own king. Um, and that it's both giving you strength in that area, but also weakening your king. So it's like double-edged and tricky. Um, whereas when you've got space on the queen side, I think people feel very free to play to play on the queen side and make like a pawn storm in advance and gain more and more positional advantages on that side of the board because they're not risking or committing their king. And you can think of that in terms of the king's Indian defense, which is a famous example of a game of, of an opening where you pawn storm on the side of the board where your king isn't. And most people prefer playing the white side of the classical king's Indian variations nowadays. That's that's all I can I can tell you on that at the moment basically is like I think I think there's a large number of people who feel more comfortable pursuing a positional advantage on the side of the board where their king isn't because it's kind of like risk free to advance and push and trade and open things up there whereas if you're trying to do the same thing on the side of the board where your king is there's a kind of like double-edgedness to it, a, a, a counterplay um, against your own king as the position opens up that a lot of players just don't feel is as good. And me personally, I don't understand chess well enough to tell you what's right or wrong on that one. That's like some deep middle game strategic understanding that I don't quite have. I've got a pretty good grasp on strategy in the opening but then it kind of starts to taper off as we get into the middle game and there are some, some structures where I can't explain to you why it's good or bad for one side or the other. All right. Uh, let's see if I missed any important questions in the last second as I was thinking there. Yes, I speak German. Um g3 is common against the dutch followed by bishop g2 yes but b3 is less common in closed sicilians yes although b3 is an unexplored area of those closed sicilians which i think is not necessarily bad there are Yeah, there are there are variations of the closed Sicilian or Grand Prix type attack Sicilian positions where I think you can play b3 and bishop b2 actually, even though it's not really done. I think this could be playable doing this kind of thing. Um, yeah, and um, Crazy G is saying that the c8 bishop is going to be bad for black in the closed Sicilian, and they can't fianchetto it because white gets to g2 first. Well, actually, I mean, they could fianchetto it, but it does often just sit on d7 in the closed Sicilian and not be a great piece. So, yeah. Yeah. All right, so um, now 
let's do a little bit more blitz and then we'll look at some of these games over here from the Russian championships today. Okay. Any of you want to play with me today? <laughs> oh, okay. Crazy G corrects me. What he was actually referring to is in the Dutch. Um, that he finds that in the Dutch, this bishop is often bad. On this diagonal, it's blocked by these pawns. And if white plays g3 first before black plays b6, um, then you're not able to get it to b7. So this might be one of the reasons people don't like this opening as much is that they have trouble getting this bishop here. Whereas in the Sicilian variation, nope, that's not the Sicilian variation. In the Sicilian variation, black can very quickly play g6, bishop, g7, and this bishop's okay and works well with the pawn on c5. And one answer in the comments that's interesting is that the c8 bishop is just supposed to sit on c8, and that's its best square in the Dutch defense. Sure. All right. 